Okay, we're going to get a read on what the truss rod will and will not take care of as far as the lay of the neck goes. Okay, let's adjust this truss rod and see how much of a difference it makes. Here we go. Let's put a quarter of a turn. Okay, we're going to check this as we go here. Here's a 10 inch straight edge, kind of middle of the neck. Yeah, okay, so that's actually going in a bit of a back bow. So we'll relieve that a little bit and check it again. Yeah, let's relieve it a little bit more. Try that. shorter straight edge. It's the six inch. Just spanning those first four frets. And then gradually making my way up the now. Okay. Got a bit of tick in there. See it's it's fine here in the first string. And it's actually fine on the sixth string. So that high spot is just in the center. So this is where you know you really gotta move with caution at this point. We're trying to get that neck as straight as we possibly can before we go near it with a file. Okay, I've switched down to my 3 inch. A couple of little spots here. I will mark them as I always do with some chalk to kind of highlight them and go to do our leveling. There's no guessing games. Now, I would imagine that this guitar, I'm sure they must have uh, use the uh, fancy CNC machine but it didn't save them did it? Overall you know it's looking pretty good but uh, there are some spots that need to be taken care of. Okay, that's the culprit right there so we have adjusted the lay of the neck as straight as we can possibly get it. There's a high spot here, high spot on the sixth string. It's funny, the eighth string is fine. At the seventh fret, it's from the fourth string to the first string, the low E and A are fine. Up here at the twelfth fret, it is just the third string. But we're not done yet. Have a look at this. When I put my 10 inch straight edge up, this is why I love the 10 inch straight edge because you can check the neck in thirds, top third, kind of middle third, bottom third. So when I put that up to the last fret and I stick that two thou feeler gauge, well guess what? All of these frets at the neck to body junction, one more time, they've all got to be dressed. It is not quite as apparent on the top strings. It stops a little sooner on the treble side. So at this junction, most of the meat needs to be taken off from the base side over to about the middle. It's just like the top three frets. Okay, so next step. Okay, this is one more instance where we have a low-tech solution to a high-tech challenge. These are 10 to 46 strings. We're going to back them off, and I'm going to count the turns. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 1, 2. Okay, so next. Got a piece of hockey puck here. Are you surprised? <laughs> okay, here we go. And we got a hockey puck here at the nut. So we've got those strings raised up so we can slip our file under there. The real test is to check all of those high spots with our straight edges to make sure they're still clicking. The objective here is to get the same amount of tension on the neck that we just had as I demonstrated all those high spots. Okay, I need to prove to you guys that we are back to where we started. There's the high spot here, high spot here, and with a smaller straight edge. Yeah, the first string was good. It was second string, third string, and fourth string. Here it was from the fourth string up.
That's good. And up here it was just a hint on the third string only. Okay, let's get our other straight edge and check with the feeler gauge and see where we are now. This is a two thou feeler gauge. Remember it stopped a little sooner eh, on the treble side. Well, we're right back to where we were. So now, and only now, will we slip the file under there and hit those high spots. And then we'll come back again with the straight edge. All right, we got that neck where we want it. No ticking now. Okay, so this is done. Let's get that smaller straight edge and that's taken care of. Okay, so now we go back to our two thou feeler gauge and see if we can get that under there now. Yes, we still can. So we still got a little ways to go at that top end. The center of the fingerboard is perfect. I cannot get that two thou feeler gauge under there anywhere along. What about the treble side? Treble side. No. So it's just on the bass side. So it's just around the A string. There, right there. So all we need is just to breeze it underneath the A string and we're ready to go to recrowning. Let's try that again. There. <laughs> That's got it. So there you go. There's a low-tech solution to a high-tech problem. The $160,000 CNC machine did not get those spots, but we did. So the idea here is the body is held, supported along its length. The V-blocks move telescopically to support the flexible part of the neck. You saw how much it flexed when I adjusted that truss rod. And then the entire length of that neck support pivots and finds its own center. So this is it. We've basically got the trajectory along the string path. I know you keep hearing me say that, but that trajectory along the string path right now is laser straight. Now obviously it's going to move when I take the strings off, but that's no longer a concern. When the whole job is done and the neck will be perfectly straight and all the high spots will be dressed, now we're going to recrown, buff and polish. Take a look at this. This is wiggling. The actual female insert is wiggling as well as the thumb wheel post. So we're going to take care of that before we do anything else. Well, no more slopping around now. These things are rock solid as they should be. And now even the bridge is a it's a good press fit. What we got here is a Kind of light density foam peel and stick. This will help us balance that pickup. Like it often happens, these neck pickups tend to kind of tilt forward a little bit. As we tighten that pickup ring down, it pushes up this side of the pickup so that it is in line with the string path. So it's not tilting forward now, it's in line with the string path. This one already was, so it didn't need any help. My fix for the bridge posts, uh, one thing I did, you know, there was a fellow that mentioned recently on the channel about, uh, he said, yeah, I do exactly the same thing. Well, that's good. But what you do have to be careful with is on this side, this bridge post is also the bridge ground. So you don't want to use Teflon tape like your. What I use in this instance is that very thin peel and stick 
duct tape because obviously it's a conductor, conducts electricity and this way you don't upset the ground wire. On this side I did use Teflon tape and that's, <laughs> there's no slopping around now man, this thing's 100%. Just another hockey puck trick. Better be careful, I'm going to have the NHL officials knocking at my door. A nice safe way to lower those thumb wheels. The outside of the puck is knurled, right? So you got all kinds of traction. Definitely easier on the fingers. I've got these posts, or the tolerances are nice and tight now. Okay, so so when I go to check this, I'm kind of eyeing down the neck. I'm pushing the string down at the first fret and eyeing along the length of the neck, and that looks pretty good. I just check that base side again. Yeah, it's pretty good. So now we can tune the guitar. Well, here is our proverbial moment of truth, and here we go. Well, now that you've seen how accurate this guitar tunes, I'm going to explain why we swapped out the bridge. I could not get enough travel to bring that saddle back. This saddle is back as far as it can go, and I've actually filed it ever so slightly to bring it back even further. And that's what that string needed to intonate. And when you look closely at this side, you can see that the first string saddle is backed tight against the casting. The second string is forward just a little bit. The G string saddle I had to remove, flip 180 and reinstall. And that's where we ended up to get this thing to be perfectly in tune. Now realistically this post should have been back about 3 sixteenths of an inch. Even this one could have went back about 3 sixteenths of an inch. So I just happen to have another ES-345 in 1967. Let's go look at that bridge. Okay, a couple of interesting things about this. We've all seen this type of bridge before. There is no wire retainer on this bridge. It's missing. So you can see in the six string saddle, it's pulled tight to the back. Now with this one, it's easy enough to pop it out, flip the saddle 180, and then take the whole bridge off and rotate it. But we're not going there yet. It remains to be seen in this orientation how accurate we will be able to get the tuning. And if need be, well, I have a replacement bridge that I know has the travel we need to line this up. Let me pull back. There are a couple other things I want to point out. This year they had switched to the trapeze tailpiece. Now there is a solid stringer block in there and you could actually convert this to a stop tailpiece if he chose to do so, but we're not going to go there. It's really unnecessary. The other thing in this model, you can see the length of the pick guard. It actually sweeps way past the bridge. And on this 1967, well, it just swoops right from the back of the bridge pickup. On Dave's guitar, even after completing the fret dress, we are still left with 49 thou of fret. 
tons of fret. Not the case on Alan's guitar. This has 26 thou. <laughs> anyway, we, we did discuss this. This is getting a complete refret. We are actually going with EVO 51100 because this is actually a fairly wide fret. Yeah, it's 103. So once those frets are out, then it'll give us the opportunity to correct the lay of the neck and the fingerboard, make sure that truss rod is 100% functional, and all new frets. And as always, we'll give you play-by-play -play on this one as well. But David is anxious, I'm sure, to get this guitar back. So I'm going to finish that up. We'll call it a day, and we'll bring David's 345 in, plug it in, and really have a listen. One last look before we bring this in. And this, of course, is the compensated nut. Now, this is E-flat tuning, remember, so 10 to 46 E-flat tuning. Under the 6th string, you can see that relief cut where it's actually a negative value. So we've cut in past the actual glue line of the nut into the body of the nut to get that to intonate. The 5th string is cut in even deeper. The D string does cantilever ever so slightly. The G definitely cantilevers past the end of the fingerboard. And the second string is pretty well right at the end of the fingerboard and the high E is also a slight negative value deeper into the nut than the end of the fingerboard. So now for the real test. Let's hear some chords. So when I went online and looked up some videos to take a stab at this Veritone selector switch and what it does exactly, I got two things. I got a very technical electrical schematic that really didn't tell my ear anything at all. The other videos I came across were just guys that could really play around. But what I was really looking for was a very condensed audio version of what it sounds like switching from one to two to three to four. So, so what I'm gonna do in this case, I'm gonna do a repeated chord progression I'll do it a couple of times and then stop, play the exact same thing again two times, stop, etc, etc. So I'm starting with number one. It's like a B minor funk uh, vamp. So that was number one. And then this is the last one, number six. So that was both pickups on, pickup selector in the middle position, all four potentiometers, volume and tone wide open. Now, obviously, you can go on for days on variations on that, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the same thing again. I'll do a shorter version with just the neck pickup on. So we're going to start again with the first position, and I'm just going to do this. Next position. Next position. Next position. And six. So let that play. Again, both pickups on. Veritone selector on one. Two. 
turn the six position switch to one, the Veritone selector is essentially off, so it's just a kind of a standard ES335. Two volumes, two tones, and pickup selector. And once you flick to two, three, four, five, six, they're all different configurations of capacitors that, you know, just give you different tones, right? It might be a bit monotonous to listen to the same lick over and over again, but really uh, it gives you the best idea of exactly what type of tonal changes happen when you flick that switch. So this is both pickups, Veritone off. <laughs> Second position. Third. Fourth. Five. So really, it's up to everybody individually to make the call on what they like, what they don't like. Some of those thinner sounds are nice for, you know, kind of funk. Okay, now I'll just do the round robin of chords. So for the first position chords, which are always a killer on the shorter scale guitars. It's always the um, interval of a minor ninth or a minor second, which is a semitone. When you play those two notes together, it just sounds out of tune. But when you play it again within the context of an arpeggiated chord, found that that's also another good litmus test for uh, intonation across the neck. The next group of strings of course would be... 